Hi everybody, Professor Cruz here. Welcome to our week one lecture for our World Religions and Global Studies class, RELS 332, where we're diving into this um, first week thinking about the way that global trends have changed religion today and how scholars in the past have been trying to make sense of um, the changes that globalization and other global dynamics are having on religion. So just as a reminder, this week we've got four articles we are looking at. Global Religions Today by Tweed, Religious Politics in the New World Order by Jürgens Meyer and a couple other authors. Um, Orientation, Did Religion Do It? by Schleiser and um, several other authors. And Religious Nationalism in the Global World, uh, again by Jürgens Meyer, which is in some ways an update of the earlier article that we read. So just to kind of give you a broad sense of what um, this first week's lecture and the kind of themes we're talking about and that kind of big picture, there's really kind of two key issues that I want to highlight. The first is the way that the post-World War II world was thought about by scholars, particularly scholars of religion, and the debates about um, how important was religion in the world. As many as we'll see, or as you remember from the readings, um, were convinced that we were seeing a decline in religion globally after World War II. And so that's one of the important themes for this week. The second one is, how do we make sense of these sort of complicated connections between um, religion on one hand and violence on the other? Something that a number of our articles talked about this week and we'll see is a continuing theme in next week as well. So as our authors this week have argued, for much of that period in the 1960s and into the 1970s, that sort of countercultural era in the United States and many other parts of the world, there was this belief that um, secularism as a, a, an idea and secular nationalism in particular were becoming more important globally, and that religion and its importance was increasingly shrinking. In fact, uh, as you will recall from the readings, um, this very kind of idea came to be known as the secularization thesis. But by the 1980s, as our authors talk about, um, it was clear that uh, religion actually wasn't going away. And in fact, many argue that it never really went away. Um, it was simply changing in new ways. And so what we saw during this period was that popular expressions of religion or religiosity uh, were evolving in relation to these expanding and changing dynamics and pressures. Um, things that we today associate with globalization and this emerging globally interconnected world that really became um, much more important in the beginning of the 19, uh, 90s, 1990s. Um, but as our authors also note, this renewed uh, sort of importance of religion or sort of the new uh, rising influence of religion um, also gave rise to new forms of religious nationalism as well as ethnic and religious violence that were wrapped up with um, these globalizing processes. And so that made many scholars wonder, well, we're seeing this resurgence of um, religion and globalization and violence, is there a connection between this sort of religious nationalism um, and globalization to explain why we're seeing more religious related um, violence? And the answer, as our authors this week talk about, is to basically say um, yes and no, that it's complicated. Um, and we need to look at specific historical examples and specific context to be able to answer um, why religion may or may not be playing a role and either helping to increase violence or possibly helping to decrease or ameliorate violence. But what we do know and what most scholars are in agreement today is that there is a clear connection between religious violence and globalization, but oftentimes there's actually deeper social issues that are at the, really the root of um, what we might think of at first glance as religious violence. So being able to untangle those becomes a really important challenge, not just for religious studies scholars, um, but for everyone. So that's kind of a broad um, picture of the sort of what we're thinking about this week as we look at these interconnections with religion and violence and globalization. So in the first article we read from uh, Tweed, Global Religions Today, as you recall, Tweed argues that it was really unclear in that period right after the World War II was over, um, whether religion and the nationalist impulses, as he describes it, and industrial economies that um, they kind of gave birth to, was bringing people together or pulling them apart. And he argues that that question became even more difficult to answer after the 1970s, when we saw kind of this resurgence of political uh, religion and increasing global flows again, 
this is sort of the lead up into what we think of as the globalization of the 1990s, um, as well as increasing um, and accelerating environmental problems, which by the 1970s um, started to become more important. So we see really this shift, he argues, between uh, the former industrial age, sort of the pre-World War II, 1945 period, and this transition into this new sort of information age or digital age, which was happening in the late 70s, but really kind of fully came into bloom by the beginning of the 1990s. So Tweet argues that we can think about some of these post-World War II religious traditions as um, sometimes helping to bring people together. So we could think about the UN Declaration of Human Rights, which was adopted in 1948, influence of Catholic liberation theology, particularly in Central and South America, um, the emergence of feminist theologies and questions about gender equity within the church and within different religious institutions. Um, we also saw the rise sort of of religious influence, civil rights, and social justice movements. So someone like B.R. Ambedkar in India or Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in the United States um, were just a few figures that were coming out of this growing global uh, awareness and kind of resurging religiosity. And then also something like Earth Day in 1970 and this emerging ecological awareness on the part of many members of religious traditions. So we step back for a second and think about, well, what does this religious landscape look like today on the global level? And our author gives us a bit of a sense, so you can see that pie chart on the left, religious believers globally. And clearly, um, Christians and Muslims, followed by Hindus, make up your sort of three largest blocks of religious um, adherence. Obviously, Christianity and Islam by far being the two largest. But also still uh, Buddhist, indigenous traditions, Jewish, and then the other traditions, which would be things like Sikhism and Zoroastrianism, uh, Taoism. Confucianism and the other sort of smaller traditions make up a significant portion, almost 80% in many cases, of sort of global population, with another roughly 15% being sort of uh, those we might call nuns. So there could be atheists or agnostic or non-religious. And within those kind of bigger categories, for example, Christianity, um, Catholics represent almost half of all of those Christians globally. And um, in the context of Muslims, uh, Sunni tradition is almost three quarters of that, 87%. So you can see um, overall, if we think about the role of religion and its impact globally, we can say very clearly that um, religion is a key part of a majority of people's lives um, around the world today, regardless of which traditions they might practice. Now, Tweed also argues that uh, religious traditions in this post-World War II period were also drivers of many global conflicts. So we can think about this kind of classic example of the Cold War, where you had the godless communists on one side versus the greedy capitalists who were always assumed to be Christian. This is So this is the U.S. and this is the Europe um, in this conflict. You can see that image there on the right um, from a Russian publication in the late 80s showing the Russian wall there with the sort of backdrop of um, industry, and then in the front you see members of different religious traditions, Orthodox, uh, Eastern Orthodox, uh, Protestants, uh, Muslims, Jews, and others, all trying to, kind of beating on the wall um, of the Soviet Union, trying to get in. But we can also think about other examples, such as European and American colonization and the role of imperialism, and this idea that um, U.S. and Europe had this uh, sort of civilizing mission, whether it's um, in parts of the African continent or whether it's an early sort of uh, colonial period and the sort of new frontier um, in the Northwest within indigenous communities here in the U.S. And we could uh, tell a similar story in uh, Mexico and Canada and many other countries. And we can think about the communist occupation of Tibet that began in 1959. We can think about the Israeli seizure and occupation of Palestinian lands in 1967 after the war. We can think about the Catholic-Protestant conflict in Northern Ireland, which really kind of exploded onto the scene in the late 60s. So really by the mid-1960s, as Tweed argues, uh, many of these religions, both big and small, were becoming less important in the world as these secular trends were growing and engaging uh, sort of more of the public, um, but that trend was not going to last for very long. But yet in that kind of moment, in the mid to late 60s, we still... Um, scholars and others had this sense that religion really was not that important. But as Tweed notes, um, it didn't really die. It, in fact, what was happening was religion was diversifying. So we think about the United States in the 1960s, the rise of kind of counterculture movements. You can see the picture there of Allen Ginsberg, sort of uh, famous troublemaker and poet with uh, Tibetan Buddhist leader Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche. 
who became an influential, uh, albeit a controversial figure um, in the United States, Europe, and later in Canada when he moved there. Um, but sort of we're all part of this emerging constellation where um, European and American youth particularly were interested in ideas from Buddhism and Hinduism, as well as Native American traditions and New Age philosophies. So all these were kind of emerging or sort of bubbling up in this period of the 60s, which led, for example, you know, Time magazine to ask in April of 1966, is God dead? And of course, we know the answer is um, no, um, but that was the kind of prevailing um, thought at that moment. So really, we think about these religious changes taking place from, let's say, the 1970s to the 2000s. Um, we really saw increasing conflicts that were sort of driven or shaped by religions. So, for example, we can think about the attack on Buddhism under Pol Pot in Cambodia in 76, the attack on the Sikh's Golden Temple of Amritsar by the Indian government and sort of allied um, Hindu nationalists in 1984, uh, the Balkan Wars between Christians and Muslim ethnic groups in 1991 to 1995. Um, here in the U.S., we saw the rise of kind of the Christian right and the moral majority led by figures like Jerry Falwell in 1979 which would then expand um, much more significantly with the election of Ronald Reagan in 1980. Now, things like the Iranian Revolution and the rise of the Islamic Republic under Ayatollah Khomeini in 1979, and a little bit more recently, the 9-11 attacks on the World Trade Center and Pentagon by Osama bin Laden in 2001. And we can certainly add more to that from this list, um, but in that kind of time period, we're seeing these kind of growing examples of religious violence. But Tweed also notes, importantly, just to kind of help us rem keep us in, um, keep this idea in mind that there's kind of both the dark and the light. So we saw many constructive roles for religion in this period as well. The 1998 Good Friday Agreements that helped bring initial sort of end of hostilities between Catholics and Protestants in Northern Ireland, even though in the late 60s, those same dynamics were leading to um, religious conflicts. And we saw involvements of different Catholic charity groups in Rwanda after the genocide in 1994. And we saw, as noted earlier, kind of an increasing number of religious denominations um, adopting various ecological statements, um, which began in the 70s but really took off by the 1990s. And it was really at that same period, kind of the cusp um, before really the internet became what we think of uh, it today, um, when it was still kind of emerging, but it was there, and religious groups really started experimenting with these new technologies, using these new you know, digital technologies, internet technologies, to both create and spread their religious ideas. So, for example, you can see a famous poster there on the right, an apple with the Dalai Lama, with the apple tagline, Think Different. And some of the examples our authors talk about, the digital tools that religious groups use to, for example, track religious holidays, or the movements of the sun and the moon, to, if you're using lunar or solar calendars to decide uh, when certain religious festivals or holidays or prayer time should start or end. Um, the general use that we kind of think of as kind of normal today of websites and email for communication, which was really still um, very new at that period. Um, the emergence of kind of virtual forms of worship, so within Hindu traditions being able to do kind of digital pujas, um, within the Muslim tradition, being able to do a virtual Hajj uh, to Mecca. So these different kind of examples of online communities, uh, specifically religious communities emerging. And we, you know, this past year has been a really great example of that with COVID-19, uh, just seeing how uh, religious communities have been adopting and adapting um, to, you know, social distancing measures, staying at home, um, closure of religious centers of worship. Um, so we really see the kind of the full blossoming of religion being digital in the last year or two. But we also see kind of at a, a deeper cultural level the diffusion of not just the technologies of digital interactions, but the language itself. So talking about, you know, deprogramming someone, for example, from a cult they may have joined, or, you know, God's GPS as a way to uh, help orient your life and find uh, your way through the, the crowd of weeds and tangles. The idea of friending God, or as one, uh, commentator noted, the lines of people waiting out front of the Apple stores for the latest iPhone as if it was Jesus' phone. It was like the return of some great icon. And so in kind of a, a bigger sense, we can think about, you know, with the emergence um, of the Gutenberg Press in 1450 and the ability to do sort of large-scale print publications, of which the Bible was the most significant um, document that was being printed and translated and sent around at that time. As an analog to the internet, 
um, in 1989 because both of them really revolutionized the way that information traveled and was communicated and religions were one of the big adopters of kind of using these new innovations um, for their benefits. Now as Tweed notes, scholars have continued to debate the links between religion and conflicts um, in the 21st century. Some see it as a unifying force, others see it as a source of conflict. So one of the theories some of you may be familiar with if you studied um, political science or even sociology or anthropology is this notion of the clash of civilizations. And this was really an argument that was first developed in the late 1990s by a political scientist in the U.S., Samuel Huntington, who essentially, if we boil down uh, sort of his argument, he assumed or argued that there were opposing cultural identities, which in his uh, sort of formulation was the Islamic civilization on one side and the Christian civilization or the West on the other. And he argued that these were sort of irreconcilable um, cultures or civilizations that would be doomed to clash and that was one of the primary sources of both cultural, political, and religious um, conflict. Another argument um, is this idea of the world of three cultures which was first developed by Mexican diplomat Miguel Basanez in 2016 and uh, what Basanez argued was that world religious traditions could be kind of grouped or placed into what he thought were three distinct uh, sort of groupings based on shared cultural traits. So you have the cultures of honor, which he um, put Hinduism, Islam, and Eastern Orthodox Christianity, and he really associated those with the idea of tradition and hierarchy and agrarian values. And then there was the cultures of achievement, which he placed Protestantism, Confucianism, and Judaism, and really associated those with hard work, um, focus on future rewards, and kind of industrial values. And then finally, he described the third one as the cultures of joy, which he placed Buddhism and Catholicism, and really saw those as kind of underlined or driven by concerns with the family, um, social interactions, and sort of post-industrial values. So it's another way of thinking about um, the role of religion and politics in these emerging global spheres. But now, as Tweed argues, and others as well, um, while these are interesting arguments, ultimately they're not extremely convincing, to, at least to religious studies scholars, because both they rely on a lot of simplifications and generalizations, and many of those claims don't actually hold up to more sort of critical scrutiny. So for example, Tweed argues, sadly both digital connectivity and ethno-religious cohesion have been among the forces of fragmentation. Computer technologies, which were inspired by this kind of spiritual vision, uh, particularly in Silicon Valley, that was supposed to bring us all together, um, has led to a loss of intimacy and lots of other um, problematic implications for political life. And he argues that overall the evidence suggests that hostility towards people of different ethnic or religious backgrounds is increasing. Um, and unfortunately, these new digital technologies are playing a role in helping the spread of this, particularly social media um, in the last few years. But he reminds us again that even though some analysts um, note this, they often forget that this, at the same time these technologies and more broadly these trends of religion in the global context are both bringing people together and forming more cohesive sort of groups, but they're also um, working as sort of an adhesive, as he notes. So forming bonds between um, different faiths in order to help work on um, shared problems. So on one hand, we see kind of religious conflicts pulling people in opposite directions, but at the same time, we see a kind of shared, let's say, religious values bringing people together to work on common problems. Let's say uh, human rights or poverty or climate change, where religion has become a center to bring people together um, in most cases, rather than kind of what's pulling them apart. Now, in Jürgens Meyer's article on religious politics and the New World Order, we get a little more kind of nuance and detail about these trends that he and other authors such as Tweed have been talking about. And Jürgen Meyer notes that one of the remarkable features of political life in this sort of global era is this rise of strident new forms of religious politics. So for example, Hindu nationalist parties in India, the sort of anti-government Buddhist movements in Sri Lanka, Christian militias here in the United States, as well as xenophobic Christian nationalists in Europe, um, Jewish extremists in Israel and Muslim um, activists in Iran, Iraq, Egypt, Palestine, and other parts of the Middle East and North Africa. So he notes um, everywhere, it seems, if you look at different religious traditions, new forms of religious activism have been on the rise. Some violent, some nonviolent, some a bit of a mix of both. 
And again, we see, as your Jürgen's Meyer notes, scholars in the 1990s were still kind of debating this decline of religion, as we were talking about, but we've certainly seen um, the resurgence of religion since um, from that 60s, 70s, 80 period um, now into our second decade of the 2000s. But public support for secularism, which originally was a core value of European Enlightenment thinking and really the heart of what we think of today as kind of modern liberal democracies, has actually been not only declining, but is actually globally under attack, or certainly, if not under attack, at least um, increasingly um, challenged. And alongside these trends, what we've also seen is an important global shift um, as countries become increasingly more diverse and more globally interconnected through ideas, through flows of people, um, through kind of cultural production, religious practices, and economics. What's happened is we've seen a fostering of more global diversity and a backlash to that same diversity, often from traditionalists and conservatives who are opposed to these various social changes. So what we're seeing here is that the relationship between religion, globalization, and politics is really complex. But some groups embrace and promote globalization while others sort of um, either oppose it or favor uh, a more kind of rigid or defined sense of nationalism. So we can think about this in two ways. One is kind of the religious uh, nationalist movements. So as we heard before, the Hindu nationalist groups like the Bharatiya Janata Party, the BJP, and the RSS in India. Um, Christian nationalist groups, like Tea Party or Proud Boys or the Oath Keepers in the United States. Um, Ultra-Orthodox Jewish Haredi groups such as the United Torah Judaism or Shas in Israel. So that's kind of one example of the religious nationalist movements that are very focused on kind of internal politics. But there's another version of this, which is the kind of religious transnational movements. Let me think about the Islamic Hamas movements in Palestine and Lebanon, um, the Islamic State of Iraq and Levant, ISIS or ISIL, um, across the Middle East and North Africa, as well as Pentecostal and charismatic forms of Christianity, which are um, exploding across Asia, Africa, and the Americas. As another version of uh, sort of religious nationalism, but not strictly focused on kind of the bounded nation state as we think about it. So Jürgens Meyer argues that um, most of these conflicts are actually not about religion, but there are other conflicts about identity, economics, privilege, and power, but they become religionized, as he describes it, um, with an aura of sacred combat. And by that he means um, the kind of existential importance of these political struggles have been kind of anchored onto and grabbed onto by religious traditions. Um, as sort of authoritative reasons for um, their positions. But Jürgens Meyer also points out that um, there's been a lot of new studies in recent years that have argued that um, religious conflict is really a byproduct of this global age for a lot of different reasons. But religion helps to legitimize these movements of rebellion by providing symbolic empowerment and also enabling these kind of religious rebels to respond to traditional cultural credibility to the challenges of globalization. So by kind of looking back on uh, traditions and cultures from kind of an earlier period and using those to kind of ground contemporary claims, that's a way to challenge these kind of uh, foreign external globalizing forces. And um, when we think about the 21st century or sort of God century as Ta, uh, Ta Philpot and Shaw talked about it in their um, excerpt we read in Jürgens Meyer's piece, you know, they talk about these same trends in the 1960s and 1970s that led people to believe that secularism was really on the rise. And, you know, at that period, it made sense. You had Fidel Castro in Cuba, you had David Ben-Gurion in Israel, you had Gamal Abdel Nasser in Egypt, the Shah of Iran. All these seem to be evidence of this growing secularism in um, the 1960s and 1970s. And um, as he notes, again, this kind of period gave us this idea of the secularization thesis, the kind of rise of secularism as the dominant kind of global political framework. And that idea really has deep roots. So came out of the European Enlightenment and philosophers who were really embracing these new ideas as that sort of idea of liberalism was emerging out of the earlier kind of feudal and monarchical periods. And so you had figures like Thomas Jefferson, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, Charles Darwin, uh, Sigmund Freud, Karl Marx, and Max Weber, um, all making these arguments about the, this new kind of secular political moment and these new forms of, um, you know, civic compacts and social um, power. But as Ta Philpott and Shah point out, 
Um, even though the secularization thesis um, was convincing for uh, a whole generation of scholars, um, really by the time we got to the 2000s, um, that argument had really lost most of its support. And in fact, uh, a growing number of people in areas that um, had been more secular in the past were quickly embracing religious ideas that were challenging secularism. So it, as they note, in India, for example, the number of people who completely agree on the separation of faith and government dropped from 78% to 50% in just five years, from 2002 to 2007. Thus, over the past four decades, religion's influence on politics has reversed its decline and become more powerful on every continent and across every major world religion. So again, that's this resurgence that we were talking about. Now, interestingly, even though we've seen religion continue to grow and this kind of secularization thesis was sort of pushed by the wayside, um, at that same period, sort of in the um, late 90s, early 2000s, you had a new generation of writers, which became known as the neo-atheists. Um, figures like uh, Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris and Christopher Hitchens and Daniel Dennett, who really tried to revive the secularization thesis. And they wanted to not only defend secularization as kind of a social good um, and something that should be um, embraced and protected and fought for, um, but in the words of Hitchens, you know, they saw religion as always and everywhere hardwired to be irrational, violent, and repressive. So we saw, in a sense, a kind of a militant secularism um, rising up in response to um, this resurgence of religion. But um, many scholars argue, um, as do Ta, Philpott, and Shaw, that this kind of neo-atheist overstated their case, um, not only by ignoring the ways that religion and globalization have you know, contributed to peace and social stability, um, but had played many other roles that are not simply about um, violence or sort of repression. So understanding how religion shapes politics has become increasingly important for us today as scholars. <coughs> Excuse me. So Jürgens Meyer argues that radical religious ideologies are behind many of these um, rebellions against authority. Yet he notes that religion gives more than a voice for the dispossessed, provides a basis for a fundamental critique of a modern nation state. And when it does that, it challenges the legitimacy of these secular institutions and national identities. And these religious ideologies, he argues at least, have emerged in this 21st century as a new basis for political legitimacy and national identity precisely because um, this former kind of secular nation state is now, he describes it as vulnerable, but certainly is more um, contested than it was before. So while secular nationalism was the reigning ideology essentially um, from the 1950s forward, um, after World War II with the rise of world uh, liberation struggles, particularly third world liberation struggles in um, parts of Latin America, Africa, and Southeast Asia, as well as the Cold War, and growing critiques of westernization, part of them fueled by these liberation struggles, um, the global appeal of secularization really began to wane um, in the 1990s under the face of all of these different global pressures. But at the same time, as we saw before, we're also seeing the emergence of more multicultural societies thanks to these globalizing dynamics. So this growing diversity was seen as a threat by some to what they imagined to be their kind of national identity or national culture. So, for example, Jürgens Meyer notes that in Europe, the presence of large immigrant populations from the Middle East ignited new forms of racism and new fears of the erosion of national values. In the United States, the Christian militia organizations were animated by fears of a massive global conspiracy involving liberal American politicians and the United Nations. And we see this uh, very clearly today with uh, the rise of QAnon, uh, anti-COVID, uh, sort of Baxter conspiracies, 5G, um, this idea that there's this sort of global cabal um, out there bent on uh, destroying not only the United States, um, but kind of Christianity uh, more broadly. So these different expressions of kind of ethnic nationalism not only challenge the authority of the secular nation state, um, but they provide an alternative source of identity and belonging um, to members who can then kind of redefine what their central ideologies are in a given society in these moments of crisis. So for those of you that may be familiar with historian Benedict Anderson, um, this is very much what he talks about when he describes the idea of imagined communities and the way that um, over time, um, communities were kind of intentionally forged or created through 
you know, shared values and images um, and uh, concepts. So in the contemporary political climate, therefore, religious nationalism provides a solution, Jurgensmeyer argues, to the problem of Western-style secular politics in a non-Western and multicultural world. Now, the challenge here, as Jurgensmeyer reminds us, is that although many members of these kind of radical religious and ethnic groups may appear to fear globalization, um, actually what they distrust more are the specifically secular aspects of globalization. So it could be global economic forces, it could be cultural forces, um, anything that they perceive as kind of undermining or undercutting their own legitimacy, and more importantly, um, what their identity and their sources of power are based on and emerge from. So nationalist groups have often embraced selectively aspects of globalization. So think about the internet and social media um, have become key parts of nationalist movements, whether it's religious nationalism, ethnic nationalism, um, because precisely because they do help these nationalist groups to spread their message. And in kind of the extreme cases, what we've seen um, kind of very troubling forms of religious nationalism are these apocalyptic uh, kind of nationalists or apocalyptic religious organizations who frame their struggles in the language of cosmic wars or holy wars, as Jurgens Meyer noted earlier, um, which often include calls to violence in order to bring about some kind of an imagined end times prophecy. So we can think about the Branch Davidians in Waco, Texas is one example. Uh, Om Shinrikyo example in Japan with the gassing of the subways or some of the Messianic Jews and attacks that have taken place in Israel and in Palestine and the West Bank. So these, uh, just a few of the many examples of these kind of apocalyptic um, religious violence that take some of these ideas um, to the extreme when they feel that their identities are under attack um, by these various globalizing forces. Now, these diverse global social movements don't have a single approach to how they understand globalization. So rather, you know, they're picking and choosing um, which aspects of globalization they're opposed to and which um, they embrace. We might think about this in the United States context, um, people who are arguing they're you know, against the globalist agendas, um, but they have no problem you know, using internet technologies and smartphones and lots of other devices bought through Amazon and other entities um, that are deeply embedded in these larger kind of global structures and networks. So Jürgen Meyer argues the crucial problem in an era of globalization are identity and control. And it's for these reasons, the assertion of traditional forms of religious and ethnic identity are linked to attempts to reclaim both personal and more sort of larger cultural power. But he argues, until there's really kind of a more stable sense of citizenship in this emerging global order that we really don't have right now, um, these religious visions of a particular moral order will continue to appeal um, and be attractive to some individuals, even though they're disruptive and ultimately don't provide a solution to our identity and our belonging in this global world, but they make uh, help some individuals make more sense of their role in this sort of uncertain period. And we've certainly seen this play out in the U.S. and Europe, and really in many countries um, in terms of a kind of growing cultural war uh, between competing political interests. So in, we might think about uh, religious nationalists on one side, who really want to turn back the clock on social changes and reforms and sort of secular advocates. They may be global advocates or not, um, but they're not religious nationalists who are advocating to you know, consolidate and expand these global gains, social rights and political rights that have been made in recent decades. And you're really seeing kind of a tension between those two different kind of competing camps. And these struggles are playing out, you know, around issues of abortion, around issues of voting reform and racial justice, um, even debates around citizenship rights, such as we've seen in India in the last year or two. So all of these are some of the different examples that are important to keep in mind when we think about how religion and globalization are connected together. Okay, that's the end, uh, part one of this lecture for week two, and we'll pick up with the other two articles in part two of this week one lecture.